Act One of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. Cast of Characters Bernardo, read by Ernst Batinama. Francisco, Cornelius, Gentleman, Another Gentleman, and Danes. Osric, read by Martin Giessen. Horatio, read by Robert Hoffman. Marcellus, read by Christine G. Claudius, Second Clown, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Voltamond, read by David Lawrence. Laertes, read by Nathaniel W. C. Higgins. Polonius, Fortinbras, Servant, Dane, read by Algie Pug. Hamlet, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Queen Gertrude, read by Amy Graymore. Ophelia, read by Miss Avarice. Ghost, First Player. Player King, read by Bob Gonzalez. Rinaldo, read by April Gonzalez. Rosencrantz, read by Grace Garrett. Guildenstern, read by Chuck Williamson. Player Queen, read by Capricia Page. Prologue and Lucianus, read by Emily Fuca. Captain, Danes, First Priest, read by Vupahipo. First Sailor, read by Rick F. Messenger, Read by Anna Simon. First Clown. First Ambassador. Read by Alan Mapster. Lord. Read by Aidan Brack. Stage Directions. By Cynthia Moyer. Commentaries. Read by Shamim Sarwar. Act One. Scene One. Act One. Scene One. Marcellus and Bernardo have seen a ghost on the casual battlements for the past two nights. Horatio comes to investigate, and Marcellus informs the other guards that Horatio has said it's but our fantasy, and will not let Willie take hold of him. Suddenly the apparition appears, looking exactly the old Hamlet, the dead king of Denmark. The ghost of the king is dressed in his battle armor. Horatio explains to the other guards how the ambitious Fortinbras tried to conquer Denmark, but was killed by old Hamlet, who, by a sealed compact, while ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all these lands which he stood seized on to the conqueror. Elsinore, a platform before the castle. Francisco at his post. Enter to him, Bernardo. Who's there? <laughs> Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo. He. You come most carefully upon your hour. This now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. <sighs> Tis bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet, guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand, ho! Who's there? Enter Horatio and Marcellus. Friends to this ground. And liegemen to the Dane. Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier, who hath relieved you. Bernardo has my place. Oh, give you good night. Exit. Holla, Bernardo. Say, what is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good to Marcellus. What has this thing appeared again to night? I have seen nothing. Horatio says tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Tush, tush, t'will not appear. Sit down a while, and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story, what we have two nights seen. Well, sit we down, and let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all... When yon same star that's westwards from the pole had made his course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one, enter ghost. Peace, break thee off. Look, 
when it comes again. In the same figure like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. Looks it not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurpest this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak! It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay! Speak! Speak! I charge thee, speak! Exit ghost. Tis gone, and will not answer. How now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you want? Before my God, I might not this believe without the sensible and true avouch of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on when he the ambitious Norway combated. So frowned he once when, in an angry parl, he smote the sledded Polax on the ice. Tis strange. Thus twice before, and jump at this dead hour, with martial stalk hath he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work I know not, but in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good now, sit down and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land, and why such daily cast of brazen cannon, and foreign mart for implements of war, why such impress of shipwrights, whose sore task does not divide a Sunday from the week, what might be toward, that this sweety haste doth make the night joint labourer with the day? Who is that can inform me? That can I. At least the whisper goes. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by Fortinbras of Norway, thereto pricked on by a most emulet pride, dared to the combat, in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this Fortinbras, who by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit, with his life, all those his lands which he stood seized of, to the conqueror, against the which a mighty competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras had he been vanquisher, as, by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed, his fell to Hamlet. Now, sir, young Fortinbras, of unimproved metal hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of lawless resolutes, for food and diet, to some enterprise that hath a stomach in it, which is no other, as it doth well appear unto our state, but to recover of us, by strong hands and terms compulsatory, those foresaid lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations." the source of this our watch, and the chief head of this post-haste and rummage in the land. I think it be no other but e'en so. Well may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch, so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. A mote it is to trouble the mind's eye. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the grave stood tentantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets, as stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun, and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse, and even the like precursor of fierce events, as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue of the omen coming on, have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climaters and countrymen. But soft, behold, lo, where it comes again. Re-enter ghost. I'll cross it, though it blast me. Stay, illusion. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done, that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. Cock crows. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily, for knowing may avoid, oh, speak. 
or if thou hast abhorred in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it, stay, and speak. Stop it, Marcellus. Shall I strike at it with my partisan? Do, if it will not stand. Tis here. Tis here. Tis gone. Exit ghost. We do it wrong, being so majestical, to offer it the show of violence, for it is, as the air, invulnerable, and our vein blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. I have heard the cock, that is the trumpet to the morn, doth with his lofty and shrill-sounding throat awake the god of day, and, at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine, and of the truth herein this present object made probation. It faded on the crowing of the cock. Some say that ever against the season comes wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated. The bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then, they say, no spirit dares stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planet strike, no fairy takes, no witch hath powers to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. So have I heard, and do in part believe it. But, look, the morn, in russet mantle clad, walks o'er the dew of yon high eastward hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen to-night unto young Hamlet, for, upon my life, this spirit, dumb to us, will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it, as needful in our loves, fitting our duty? Let's do it, I pray, and I this morning know, where we shall find him most conveniently. Exeunt. End of Scene 1 Act 1, Scene 2 King Claudius addresses the court and talks about the sad death of his brother, old Hamlet. He then toasts his marriage to his brother's wife, Gertrude, saying with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage. In equal scale, weighing delight and dole, he has taken to wife his sometime sister. He then continues to address political problems by talking about Prince Fortin Press of Norway. Claudius gives Laertes permission to return to his studies in France, having celebrated the coronation of the new king and queen. Gertrude and Claudius then speak to Hamlet and urge him to stop grieving over his father. Claudius says to persevere in obstinate condolment is a course of imp impious stubbornness. It is unmanly grief. Hamlet is appalled by his mother's marriage to his uncle and privately says, Oh, must we get a speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. His good friend Horatio interrupts him to report that he has seen the ghost of his father. Scene 2. A room of state in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Hamlet, Polonius, Laertes, Voltimand, Cornelius, lords and attendants. Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death the memory be green, and that it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe, yet so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere, with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. 
nor have we here in Bard your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For all, our thanks. Now follows that you know, young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleagued with the dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father, with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him. Now for ourself and for this time of meeting. Thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein. In that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltimand, for bearers of this greeting to old Norway." giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these dilated articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste commend your duty. In that, that and all things, things we will show, we will our, show duty. our duty. We doubt it nothing. Heartily farewell. Exeunt Voltimand and Cornelius. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane, and loose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? My dread lord, your leave and favour to return to France. From whence so willingly I came to Denmark, to show my duty in your coronation, Yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, wrung from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last upon his will I sealed my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes. Time be thine, and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet, and my son. Aside. A little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord, I am too much of the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not for ever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Ay, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam, nay, it is. I know not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. "'Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. "'Tis unmanly grief." It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be, and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? Fie! Tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, 
whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first course till he that died to-day, this must be so. We pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof no jocund health that Denmark drinks to-day, but the great cannon to the clouds shall tell, and the kings rouse the heavens all breet again, respeaking earthly thunder. Come, away. Exeunt all but Hamlet. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon gainst self-slaughter. O oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world! Fie, aunt, ah, fie! Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king, that was to this Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember? Why, she would hang on him, as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month. Let me not think on't. Frailty thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe all tears. Why, she— even she! O oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Married, with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. O oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets— it is not, nor it cannot come to good. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Enter Horatio, Marcellus, and Bernardo. Hail to your lordship. I'm glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. The same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. Sir, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. And what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus? My good lord. I am very glad to see you. Good even, sir. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do mine ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee, do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see my father. Where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear, till I may deliver, upon the witness of these gentlemen, 
this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch, in the dead vast and middle of the night, been thus encountered. A figure, like your father, armed at point exactly, cap a pay, appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear-surprised eyes, within his truncheon's length, whilst they, distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good. The apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did. But answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motion like as it would speak. But even then the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. Tis very strange. As I do live, my honored lord, tis true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs, but this troubles me. Hold you the watch to-night. We do, we my, do lord. my lord. Armed, say you? Armed, Armed my, my lord. lord. From top to toe? My, my lord, lord, from, from head, to, head foot. to foot. Then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord, he wore his beaver up. What, looked he frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. Pale or red? Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would I had been there. It would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer, longer, longer. longer. Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in life, a sable silvered. I will watch tonight. Perchance twill walk again. I warrant it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap to-night, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. Our, Our duty, duty to your, to your honor. honor. Your loves, as mine to you. Farewell. Exeunt all but Hamlet. My father's spirit in arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come! Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes. Exit. End of scene two. Act one, scene three. Before Laertes returns to France, he encourages his sister Ophelia not to take Hamlet's wing seriously. Polonius then gives Laertes some fatherly advice for while he studies abroad and also tells Ophelia to stay away from Hamlet. Scene 3. A room in Polonius's house. Enter Laertes and Ophelia. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep, but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet and the trifling of his favor, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, forward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more but so? Think it no more, for nature crescent does not grow alone in thews and bulk, but as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide withal. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor cottle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear, his greatness weighed, his will is not his own, for he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and the health of his whole state. And therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it, as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, 
which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes withal. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain, if with too credent ear you list his songs, or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep you in the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. The chariest maid is prodigal enough, if she unmask her beauty to the moon. Virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring, to oft before their buttons be disclosed, and in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are most imminent. Be wary, then, best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep, as watchman to my heart. But, good my brother, do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whiles, like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. I stay too long. But here, my father comes. Enter Polonius. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. Yet here, Laertes, aboard, aboard, for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. There, my blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory see thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel, but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new-hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit, as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy, for the apparel oft proclaims the man. And they in France, of the best rank and station, are of a most select and generous chief in that. Neither a borrower, nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow, as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season this in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia, and remember well what I have said to you. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. Exit. What is't, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary, well be thought. Tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, as so it is put on me, and that, in way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late, made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection! Pooh! You speak like a green girl, unsifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby. That you obtain these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tend yourself more dearly, or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, running it thus, you'll tend to me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion. Aye, fashion you may call it. Go to, go to. 
and hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Ay, springs to catch woodcocks, I do know, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows, these blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promise, as it is a making, you must not take for fire, from this time, be somewhat scatter of your maiden presence, set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet, believe so much in him, that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk, than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers, not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious boards, the better to beguile. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. Exeunt. End of scene three. Act one, scene four. Hamlet meets Horatio at night to try and see the ghost for himself. The apparition appears, and Hamlet says, Angels and ministers of grace defend us, be thou a spirit of health or goblin tempt. The ghost becomes Hamlet to follow him. Scene 4. The Platform. Enter Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus. The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks twelve. No, it is struck. Indeed, I heard it not. Then it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. A flourish of trumpets and ordnance shot off within. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake to-night and takes his rouse, keeps wassail and the swaggering upspring reels. And as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle-drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? Ay, Mary, is't. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed revel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They keep us drunkards, and with swinish phrase soil our addition. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men, that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the o'ergrowth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and forts of reason, or by some habit that too much o'er leavens the form of plausive manners, that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune's star, their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of eel doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Enter ghost. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me! Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their cerements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly inurned hath oped his ponderous and marbled jaws to cast thee up again. What may this mean, that thou, dead coarse, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore? 
What should we do? The ghost beckons Hamlet. It beckons you to go away with it, as if it's some impartment to desire to you alone. Look, with that courteous action, it waves you to a more removed ground, but do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak. Then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life in a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea, and there assume some other horrible form, which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation, without more motive, into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It waves me still. Go on. I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. Be ruled. You shall not go. My fate cries out and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called. Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say, away. Go on. I'll follow thee. Exeunt ghost and Hamlet. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. Tis not fit thus to obey him. Have after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Nay, let's follow him. Exeunt. End of scene four. Act one, scene five. The ghost tells Hamlet how he was murdered by his brother, Claudius. He reveals that Claudius put poison in his ear while he was asleep and managed to seduce Jatrud. He instructs Hamlet to revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. The ghost disappears and when Hamlet tells Horatio and Marcellus what has happened, he begs them not to tell anyone. The ghost reappears and forces them to swear. The two men immediately give their word. Scene 5. Another part of the platform. Enter Ghost and Hamlet. Where wilt thou lead me? Speak, I'll go no further. Mark me. I will. My hour is almost come, when I to sulphurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Alas, poor ghost! Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood. Make thy two eyes like stars start from their spheres, thy knotted and combined locks to part, and each particular hair to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porpentine. But this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. List, list, O oh, list! If thou didst ever thy dear father love, O oh God! Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul, as in the best it is. But this most foul, strange and unnatural. Haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt. 
And duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on lethe wharf wouldst thou not stir in this. Now, Hamlet, hear, tis given out that sleeping in my orchard a serpent stung me, so the whole ear of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle! Ay, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wit, with traitorous gifts, O oh, wicked wit and gifts that have the power so to seduce one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. O oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there from me, whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved, though lewdness court it in a shape of heaven, so lust, though to a radiant angel linked, will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I sent the morning air, brief let me be. Sleeping within my orchard, my custom always of the afternoon, Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole, With juice of cursed Hebanon in a vial, And in the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distilment, Whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man, That swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, And with a sudden vigour doth posset and curd, Like eager droppings into milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine, and a most instant tetter barked about, Most laser-like, with vile and loathsome crust, all my smooth body. Thus was I, sleeping by a brother's hand, of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. Oh, horrible! Oh, horrible! Most horrible! If thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. But howsoever thou pursuest this act, taint not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven, and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge, to prick and sting her. Fare thee well at once. The glow-worm shows the matin to be near, and gins to pale his uneffectual fire. Adieu. Adieu, Hamlet, remember me. Exit. Oh, all you host of heaven. Oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? Oh, fie, hold. Hold my heart, and you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee. I, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, remember thee. Yea, from the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past, that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, by heaven! O oh, most pernicious woman! O oh, villain! Villain! Smiling, damned villain! My tables! Meet it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. 
At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. Writing. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is a Jew. A Jew, remember me. I have sworn it. My lord, my, my lord. lord. My lord. Lord Hamlet. Heaven, secure him. So be it. Hello, ho, ho, my lord. Hello, ho, ho, boy. Come, bird, come. Enter Horatio and Marcellus. How is't, my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Good, my lord, tell it. No, you'll reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Nor I, my lord. How say you then? Would heart of man once think it? But you'll be secret. Aye, by I heaven, my lord. lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an errant knave. There needs no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right. You heard the right. And so, without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You, as your business and desire shall point you, for every man hath business and desire, such as it is. And for mine own poor part, look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There's no offense, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is, Horatio, and much offense, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you, for your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars and soldiers, give me one poor request. What is it, my lord? We will. Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, my lord we, we will, will not. not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. We have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. Aha, boy, sayest thou so? Art thou there, true penny? Come on, you hear this fellow in the cellarage. Consent to swear. Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. Hick at ubique, then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay your hands again upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear. Well said, old mole. Canst work i' the earth so fast, a worthy pioneer. Once more, remove, good friends. Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. But come, here as before, never, so help you mercy, how strange or odd soe'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you, at such time seeing me, never shall, with arms encumbered thus, or this head-shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as, well, well, we know, or we could, and if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be, and if there might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you. Swear! Swear! Rest, rest, perturbed spirit. They swear. So, gentlemen, with all my love I do commend me to you, and what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together, and still, your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Nay, come, let's go together. Exeunt. End of Act One. What do we learn? The ghost of old Hamlet says that he was murdered by Claudius. Hamlet promises to avenge his father. Everyone who witnessed the ghost's appearance has sworn not to talk about it. Things to notice in Act 1. Notice how Shakespeare has chosen to open the play with the ghost's first appearance rather than with the title character, Hamlet. What tune does this set for the play? Take note of Gertrude's character and her actions. 
we learned from Hamlet that she lost her husband and then married his brother very quickly. How does Hamlet feel about this? Why do we think Jatrud might have done this? Notice how Claudius, the new king, is presented in Act 1. Does he display any suspicious behavior? How does he respond to Hamlet's grief and is this the reaction you would expect? Act 1 sets off the circumstances around old Hamlet's death and Hamlet's need for revenge, showing us how Hamlet feels about his mother's new marriage and the promises he makes to the ghost of his father to avenge his murder. How does Hamlet come across in this act? Do you think his behavior is un understandable or extreme? Hamlet by William Shakespeare Our next video on Hamlet Act 2